Let's be clear. Glenn Dennis is a controversial figure for reasons I'll explain. But his affidavit is too important to ignore. And his discrepancies can be understood, even if they've caused many UFO researchers to discount his testimony entirely. Make up your own mind about this one, but I believe it belongs in our collection of disclosure interviews whether Dennis came across such information first or secondhand. He was a mortician of the Ballard Funeral Home in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, having graduated from San Francisco College of Mortuary Sciences in 1946. Ballard did mortuary services for the Roswell Army Airfield and in July 1947, in the early afternoon of July 8th, he received a phone call from the mortuary officer of the base asking him about the availability of small caskets, how to treat bodies that have been exposed to the elements, as well as other questions regarding the preservation of dead bodies. He later told the chief of police in Roswell about it, who has later corroborated Dennis's account of their conversation. Dennis then told a nurse friend about it, who reacted by telling him she had a bigger story to tell. They met at the Roswell Army Airfield Officers Club that day to discuss what she saw, alien bodies, and according to Dennis, she described them in minute detail. She had drawn pictures and spoke of their smell that made most involved throw up at some point or another. And she went into great detail about the physiology of the crash victims. What has triggered UFO investigators is the concealment of the identity of this nurse, X. When Glenn Dennis came forward and made this interview in November 1990, he claimed to have promised never to reveal her name and that she had been transferred off base to England where she died in a plane crash. That was his early version of the story. He then changed the story, revealing the identity of the nurse to be Naomi Self. And when no record of her was found, he retracted and said he made the name up. Then he named a personal friend, a retired nurse in Roswell named Mary Lowe, who became a prime candidate for Nurse X. But when approached, she vehemently denied it, even if she had been a nurse on the Roswell base in July 1947. The problem is, another witness, Miss Huttonus, a civil employee on base in 1947, and a personal lifelong friend of Mary Lowe, corroborates Dennis' account, stating Mary also told her about the small bodies as well. There is an account of a phone call between Nurse Lowe and Dennis in 1998 where she scolds him for naming her, which can be interpreted either as his breaking of a promise or her accusing him of making false claims about her. Either way, days later, Dennis again retracted her name saying she knew nothing. To this day, this is where it stands and people with first-hand knowledge pass on. Regardless, the Glenn Dennis affidavit is rich enough and with enough corroborating data that it should be considered as part of the lexicon of Roswell testimonies. Let's listen to Glenn Dennis. Really the way I became involved in this was started out in the after early afternoon around probably 1.30 in the afternoon and I received a telephone call from the mortuary officer out at the Walker Air Force Base, Army Airfield Base. And uh, he was requiring, inquiring about what would be the smallest possible casket that we could get that would be hermetically sealed. And uh, at that time, I know that we had used like the fourth feet and uh, caskets, we had used those before, but I thought they also made them in a 3.6. So, uh, but I, he wanted to know if we had any in stock, and I said, no, but I, if I can make a call to Amarillo, I can have them in, you know, by 7 o'clock the next morning on the truck. So he said, I'll get back to you. And uh, that was the first contact that I had with the base. And then what? Then he called back... Uh, Oh, probably 45 minutes or so later. And he said, I need to ask you some more questions. He said, in case something like this should happen, he said, we, uh, 
we need to know what the preparation, what how, what your preparations are for the bodies that had been laying out in the elements, you know. And uh, you said we need to know also what uh, what if your treatments of, of the bodies are the remains, uh, what could you do to them? And if your treatments would it would it change any of the chemical breakdown of the tissues, the blood, would it make a difference? And I said, I thought probably it would. And I said, uh, of course, he knew exactly how we would treat those bodies because we have an outline from them and what we really have to do. I think he, that, he already at that point knew exactly what we would have to do. Did he disclose to you what he had? No. I told him, I said, if you... If you have a problem, if you want, you know, if you have something, you don't really know what to do about it, let me come out and I'll, you know, try to help you do whatever you want to do. So, and he said, well, you know, we don't really have anything. He said, we're sitting here thinking in case we should get involved in something like this, you know, what would be our preparation? What, what would, should we do? Then I, you know, I went through. I said, do you really want to know how we would do it? Well, yes, you know, we would like to know. So that's when I explained to him that we would have the vats that we would fill up with a, with formaldehyde solution with water. And we put the bodies in them, uh, let them stay there for 24 hours and then take them out. And uh, then we would pack the bodies in the, would be a sawdust and really a lime, uh, what we would pack them in and wrap them in the plastic. That's bodies that were badly decomposed. If there was tissue, deep tissue, we would have to do it hypodermically uh, with needles to get to the deep tissue. Then we would have to aspirate the cavities if the cavities hadn't already ruptured and then put some cavity fluid in those. I so said that's, you know, kind of normal procedure. Yeah. Take care of it for them. Well, for two, three times, yeah. And you reviewed what that conversation like that. You mean when I offered to take care of them? Yeah. He said, well, we, we don't really, right at this time, we don't really need your assistance. But he said, in case something like this should happen, then he said we would be prepared and we would know what to do. Then we got back on to the subject of maybe not damaging any of the, of the chemicals, uh, compounds or anything with the bodies or, you know, tissues, uh, whatever, because it, uh, and they want to, you know, how do you, would you pick bodies up like that and what would you do not to, to uh, contaminate any of it? You must begin to seem a little strange to you at that point. Well, I thought <clears throat> maybe what happened, they might have had a VIP or, you know, some officer and something would happen, they maybe they didn't want, you know, Want to keep it quiet and even probably want to do it themselves and not be involved with the civilian and uh, businesses or anything. So, after these conversations, you were curious and you went on out to the base, as I understand it. Can you review that? Well, no, I didn't go out to the base. Yeah, I was curious, but the only, I didn't go out to the base and probably a couple hours later. And I'd got an emergency call. There was an airman that was injured in an accident. And I took the airman to the base. He rode in the ambulance with me, and I took him out to the emergency room. And that's the way I became really involved at the base. I didn't go out just because I was curious. Give me the sequence from the time you picked up the airman and just describe to me. Well, when I got the call, you know, I left the funeral home and the ambulance went to the scene of the accident, picked the airman up. He, I did not place him on a stretcher because uh, he had a head injury in the nose. I think his nose was fractured. So I did some minor uh, first aid, and then he sat in the front seat with me all the way to the base. When we got to the base, then uh, he walked into the emergency room. I didn't uh, have to take him in. They didn't bring out a you know a gurney or anything. We just he just walked in on his own. Then I never did see him after that. Then I had this friend that I wanted to talk to and see. This uh, is a lieutenant nurse that I knew quite well. 
that had only been there approximately, only been commissioned and been there to sign. This was their first assignment to the out of, to the air base, and uh, I wanted to talk to her. And so this, I was going down the hall, and I uh, first thing the lady that I want the lieutenant that I wanted to see was coming out of one room, going across the hall to the other, and she noticed it me. She said. How did you get in here? What are you doing in here? And she said, you better get out in a hurry. She said, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. She said, would you please leave and get out of here in a hurry? And then about, I turned around and then about, and she went on into the other room. Then in about the time I had turned around, there was a, there was another officer who said, hey, wait a minute. And I said, uh, looks like you had a crash. He said, I see there's some, you know, in the ambulance, in the ambulances out there, I see a lot of wreck, and I said, where was the crash? And he said, there wasn't any crash. And he said, uh, then he said, just wait a minute. And then I, he said, wait a minute. And I, you know, stood there for a minute. And he turned around, and evidently he must have waited for somebody else to come out because there was another officer coming out. He said, this man says there was a crash out at the base. He said he wanted to know about, he was inquiring about our crash. And this was when I encountered, he was a red-headed officer and uh, very nasty, very uh, uh, rough. He said uh, he did not see any crash. There was not any cat crash. And he said, uh, you get the hell out of here and you didn't see anything and you don't talk to anybody. He said, you're going to get in a hell of a lot of trouble. And I said, look, I'm a civilian and the damn thing you can do to me about it. He said, no, but somebody might be picking your bones out of the sand. That's when he made the remark there. Then there was a black sergeant that was standing beside him. And he said, yeah, but he would make better dog food for our dogs. Of course, I didn't understand that. But my father happened to be an old trapper and for a hobby and everything. And I said, my father used guys like you for bait and his coyote traps. And then there was two MPs that joined me right on, took me outside and each holding me by my elbows and they escorted me out to the, back to the ambulance and followed me all the way back to the funeral home. Now, as you were entering the hospital, you saw something in three trucks. Yeah, when, yeah, because usually where I parked, there was three field ambulances parked in the area where I usually park when we back up to the to the ramps. So I just pulled up to the side in front of those and parked up in front and the airman and I got out and walked in. So uh, when I passed, when I got up, went up the steps and up the ramp and I was walking, uh, going into the emergency room, I noticed that the doors were open, and then, uh, they, but what was odd about it, there was an MP standing beside each one of the vehicles in the back, just standing there. And the doors were open. Naturally, I was curious, and, you know, I just happened to look in. That's when I saw some debris that looked like parts of the plane or something that they hadn't had a crash, because I've seen them do this a lot of times, bring in pieces in the old ambulances in. Can you describe the debris? Yeah, they were, I noticed in two of the ambulances there was some debris that was probably two and a half to three feet, you know, long and probably high that was propped up on the side of the ambulance there. They were kind of in the shape of maybe like a half a canoe. They, they were uh, like the front part of a canoe. And... Uh, you know, it looked like it looked like it might be aluminum, but it it looked more like it was the metal looked more like stainless steel that had been heated. It was blue, kind of a bluish tint to it. And what was odd about it? It looked like around the curved part in the front of the canoe there was some there was some uh, designs or something. It kind of reminded me of maybe some Egyptian signs or whatever, and it was probably about three inches and high and probably the length of what the wreckage I saw it looked like it was the length. And the same thing was in, in the other ambulance too. I mean, I saw practically the same thing. The the pieces that were practically the same size and uh, the insignias looked like whatever that might be. 
was uh, part of the wreckage. How did Nate, how did Sue Frank <laughs> feel about what she saw? Well, I didn't know really until, until, uh, uh, until the next day. And I wanted to, I called out and I kept trying to get a hold of him because naturally I was curious and I wanted to know what was going on. And so I called out the next day and then probably around 11.30 and she said, I know you've been trying to get a hold of me, but I haven't been available. And she said, why don't you meet me at the officer's club? If you if you have time, meet me at the officer's club and we'll have lunch and I want to, I want to talk to you. And uh, the funeral home we had it at that time we had all the some of the businesses there had an associate membership to the officers club, and our funeral home had that membership, and also they had a card to identify myself and what business that I was you know associated with. So I had no problem. One time I go to the base, all I had to do a lot of times if it was in the evening I'd have to stop and sign a visitor and get a visitor's pass and then turn it in when I left. There was no problem going out there. So I went on out and met her. Big pregnant. Tell me about lunch. Well, we, you know, both ordered. I'm not sure remember what we ordered, but it was just a light, just a light lunch. But she was so upset. Uh, she looked like she's, you know, in shock is what she really talked like and looked like. And... Uh, she said, I want to, she said, I said, well, I'm just curious on the reason I want to talk to you. I was curious on what happened. And she said, well, you won't believe it. And she says, I don't believe it either. But she said, uh, I got in a lot of trouble on this thing. I probably, I'm not real sure about this. But she said, when I, then she pulled out of a little purse or a little pocketbook, whatever she had there. She gave me a little diagram that she had that she had drawn some dry, some uh, figures of uh, of some arms and uh, face and so on. She told me that this is what you know was what was in those that it was a crash, it wasn't an airplane, but they didn't know what it was at that time. These were bodies. Yeah, but she said we have three bodies. That there was three bodies. She said two of them were very mutilated. One looked like it might have walked out or that it, you know, might have lived a, a little while. And she explained they were like three and a half feet, four feet tall. The uh, two of the bodies were, the, the you couldn't identify much because they were practically destroyed. And it looked like maybe that they might have been uh, a predatory animal or something might have... Uh, been doing some damage on the bodies too. How did she describe the head, the hands? Well, she said the head, and then the the little drawings that I had. She the way she explained it and the way she drew it that the heads were somewhat larger than than a human heads. The hands were long, no thumbs. It was just the long, very delicate fingers at the end of the on the underside at the tip of each finger was a pad like. Uh, maybe a little pad, but it looked like the skin had maybe a little suction, like the little suction cups on those. On the uh, no fingernails on the hands. The head, the lips were very just a long, narrow, more or less uh, not full lips like we would have in, a, in most of our people, but very fine line, very fine lips. Uh, there was no teeth that was the inside of the mouth that was, it was kind of like a real, uh, a gums, or maybe it was, uh, she said, explain it, it was almost as hard as if it was rawhide, maybe, at that. The, uh, the ears, there was only two small orifices on each side of the head with, you know, looked like a couple of small lobes that might, some way that might cover both of those but there was not a protruding ear. And also that the nose, there was only two small orifices in the nose. It was, there was really no nose that was the convex. It was all just uh, flesh with the, uh, the face. Was she emotional about all this? Very much so, very emotional. 
she would have to stop and drink water every once in a while. And uh, also, uh, she never touched a meal at all the time. We were talking in an hour and a half that we were there. She never touched a meal. Any other demonstrations of the indications of hostage itself? Well, just, you know, every once in a while she'd go like this, you know, then wringing her hands. And she said, it was the most, most, uh, I've never been so horrified in my life. I've never seen anything so gruesome in my life. I've never smelt anything that smelt worse in my life. And she told me that when I saw her, she was leaving the room to go to the bathroom because she was deathly ill and was going to throw up. Did she recognize any of the doctors by the examining the body? She told me, uh, she said, I don't, well, I asked her that question, which of the doctors, and she said, I don't know that, she said, I don't know that I knew them. And that was her answer. So, but she said she walked in the room and they said, hey, we need you, you need to help us. And uh, that was the way she became involved in it. And then she got ill, the doctors also became very ill. They would have to do a little examination and they'd have to leave and go sit down and then they would come back and do a little bit more. It was that bad. Well, yeah, we'd missed it a while, and then I had to get back to the funeral home and go back to work, but uh, then uh, I never did see her after that, and I called out the next day to see how she was feeling, see what, and they told me that she wasn't available. Then I wouldn't be available that day. I called the next day. And they told me that she'd been transferred. And it was rather odd because she'd only been at the base less than three months. That was her non-commissioned less than three months and that was her first assignment. So it was rather odd that she would be transferred out, you know, within three months. So later on they attempted to I guess you got a letter. Then about two weeks, probably two weeks, at least two weeks. Could have been a little longer, but I know it was at least two weeks. I got a I got a letter addressed to me at Glenn Dennis at the Ballard Funeral Home with, uh, she didn't sign, didn't have any return address or anything on it, but inside of the letter, it was just a note. She said, I don't have time to write. I will write later. This is my APO number. And that was, that was the extent of it. So then I wrote back to her and, uh, asking her more or less how, you know, how she was feeling and why the sudden transfer. And then I was hoped that she wasn't in any trouble. It was just a short note. I really didn't go into a lot of detail or anything. Then probably three weeks or probably a month after that, then I got the letter that I had mailed to her. It was returned, it was stamped return. And also it on, on in red printing, it said deceased. And that's the last time I ever heard or heard anything about it. Then, well, probably, then I went out to the base uh, a few days later and I was talking to one of the nurses and I said, you know, whatever happened to the lieutenant? And she said, well, the rumor is that we heard that she was killed with five other nurses in a training mission in a plane crash. And that was it. No indication for her. Well, it was in London, England. She said in, my, in the note that she sent me that she was in London stationed in London, and that was it. That's the last time I ever heard. Do you believe that she's dead? No, I don't think so. After all that's happening and after, you know, threatening me and everything, I doubt very seriously that she was. I would hope not. What would you like to say to her if she happened to see the Well, if she happened to see it, and if she, she feels like the... You know, if she wants to talk, if she feels like I would like to hear from her, yes. To see what's been going on in her life and why she wasn't able to contact me. If she, you know, feels like it. That's not clear for her. Um, now, the sir. Told your father you were in trouble. 
okay, what happened there? Then the next day after I was there, when I had the problem with the uh, officer and the black man, I was told my father was contacted by our sheriff, George Wilcox, which was a very close friend of my father. They were very good friends. And uh, he called uh, to see if my father was home because he wanted to come out and talk to my father. And he did so, and he told my father that there was a black sergeant from the base that came to, the, to his office, was inquiring about who my parents were, my mother and my father, if I had any brothers or sisters, and all, you know, wanted to know my, uh, what my personal family, who they were and where they were. George said that he didn't, he knew I had some family, but he didn't know, you know, where they were or anything else. So anyway, he told my father that uh, he did contact my father, and he told my father that he thought I might be in some trouble. And, uh, but he didn't, they evidently didn't explain why I was in trouble. So, you know, first thing my father did was get in his car and come to the funeral home. He said we had to talk because he and I were very close. We were real, you know, real good friends. The best friend I ever had was my father. He said, I've got to talk. He said, hey, if you're in trouble, he said, we, we've got to do something about it. And I said, I'm not in trouble. And he said, well, you are. He said, George Wilcock told me that you were in a lot of trouble and that you got involved in something that you had no business getting involved in and that you could be in a lot of trouble. And I said, and then, so I told my father the story. And he's the only man that I've ever told this story to until I talked to Stan Friedman and to you people, and that's it, period. And I did tell my father what, what the story was. Of course, it was, you know, it was unbelievable for him. But then he became very upset and he wanted to go shoot a few people and all that because they did threaten my life and, you know, and they, uh, so that was the way my father heard about it and that was the extent of my family. And he never would tell them who my brother, and I had a brother that was a fighter pilot during that time. And I had three sisters and uh, one of them was a nurse. But I, but he would never tell them anything. And so he didn't tell the sheriff or anybody else because the sheriff was supposed to call him back and give him the names of where they were at and he wouldn't do it. Let's get back to uh, your prior Did she express an opinion as to what she thought these feelings were? Did she think, did she think they came to the... Well, <clears throat> she... All she was, all, the only remark that she ever made was that they definitely weren't humans, as, as we know humans, but they could be from another planet. Or the doctors were explaining this, that they couldn't be from our planet. They had to be an alien, it had to be something else, but not, not in our planet. She had a phrase she used to describe how they looked to her. Do you remember that? They were telling me, like little black China. Well, she said that, well, of course they were, you know, first thing she said they were black. They were just as black as they could be, but probably laying out in the elements in, in July in Roswell with 105 to 110 temperature every day and 80 degrees or so at night. I mean, that's not, that wouldn't be uncommon because we picked up a lot of sheep herds of people that had been found dead that's laying in the desert, you know, for days and getting the rattlesnakes or whatever. And they do turn, you know, as black as they can. And uh, I know exactly what they were talking about because uh, with the smell and the odor being so drastic because this is a very unpleasant situation, you know. And uh, talk about their eyes. How would she describe their eyes? Well, she said that, of course, their eyes were set back into the skull. Oh, and it was a remarkable, I thought it was interesting also that she said their skulls, the doctor said their skull bone structure wasn't like ours, it wasn't a, actually a bone, it was probably a real heavy cartilage, it, it looked more or less like a newborn baby, the skull was very pliable, you could mash on the skull and it would, you know, it would give, and so... It, the bone structure, it wasn't, bones not like our bones, it was our skull and everything. What about the bones in the hands? 
said very fine, very delicate, the arm bones, they liked the radial yellow in the arm that uh, it was so fine that he doubted if they could lift, you know, she said they doubted if they could, anyone in, that that size in the arms of that could lift 50 pounds on the earth or anywhere else, and, you know, they doubted they had that strength. But she said what, the one that hadn't been uh, mutilated to a great extent, it reminded him of a real small ancient Chinese person, no hair at all, and uh, very, very uh, delicate skin. In fact, he said the skin would look like they could almost see to it, almost transparent. Um, why don't you give me a paragraph on the ears and the nostrils? Well, the ears, like I think I stated to you, that the ears. There was a couple of small orifices, one on top of the other, with two little lobe flaps, one over the other. They didn't really know how those, if they had any significance, how they worked or what. They wasn't, I mean, they didn't go into that. The nose was only a couple of very small orifices, holes right there, just above the lip line. But it had, uh, there wasn't anything covering it. And it was just like two small indentations there, and that was it. Said it was very unusual. Is anywhere else uh, blind? Uh, you talk about the hands. The hands. Yeah. The, the, the hands. Well, there was one hand. There was there was one hand that evidently that uh, wasn't attached to the arm. And she said that where she got sick and left the room was that the doctor had to go on force up and pick the hand up and turn it over. And that's when they noticed. Now, there wasn't any thumb, none of them had, none of the bodies had any thumbs or anything. They were just long, very fine, uh, very delicate fingers, no fingernails. But right at the tip of each finger, right at the tip of each finger, it looked like there was a pad. And in this pad, it looked like it might have had very small little, they were like little suction cups, but very minute suction cups. The doctors, that's the way he explained it. But you were asking me to, to describe the arms, and this was another thing that the lieutenant brought out that it was that it was very uh, the difference between theirs and ours that the that the from the wrist to the first joint here that it was probably one and a half times longer than the top part up here. It was that was very odd looking. It was very odd. She said, and uh, the. Uh, very small, very small arms, very small. Bone structure? Bone structure was, bone structure, uh, I had, of course I asked her about the bones because we were talking about the wrist bones and everything and she said it was very similar to ours, but the bones were so small that, that their bones probably wasn't in, in the arm, wasn't any larger than my finger. She, we never mentioned it, never talked about the dress. Did she say anything about sex or was she one? She said she really never, she was so sick and everything that it never even entered her mind. <laughs> so that was it. I guess not. You know what you term sex of the beings then? Well, it wasn't discussed with her, it probably was, but she, like she said, I was so ill and so horrified that, that I don't, you know, she said, she sat up all night and then she knew I was going to be real concerned, knew I was going to be on what happened, you know, she knew that I got in trouble, probably. And she would, through that, you know, she sat up and made little notes on the back of these little prescription pads. And that's what, she had her notes made out and that's what we discussed, particularly what she had. I was very interested that you had kept so many records of the incident and pertaining regarding the beautiful expression. And you kept them in the uh, uh, Barrett Valley, and then later they disappeared. Yeah. Did you give us a... a well, <clears throat> I was really in charge of all of the military contracts. I did all the bids and everything and really took care of all the contracts myself. And uh, that was that was one of my duties at the funeral, to take care of the military. And I had a file. I had a file on everything that ever happened at Walker Air Base. That, like 
Bob Hope and different, some of the big orchestras and everybody would come and have the big parties and everything in the hangars, you know, I attended, but I would also have pictures and everything. And I had a personal file that I kept. And I kept everything in this file that 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 pertained that I attended or whatever. And this is where I put the uh, diagrams and the notes that she gave me was in my personal file. And then the Ballard Funeral Home sold at a later date, several years later, that it sold. And the people that bought the funeral home, these were files that they were the old files that 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 they kept in the basement down in the furnace room. And they had all the mil I had all the military files together in one filing cabinet. Everything had happened at the base and everything. We also had the contract at Fort Sumner Air Base. They had a glider base there and also uh, uh, fighter pilot training there and the B-47 and 51s and so on. And so I, I had all the files. Everything was one filing cabinet was strictly all military. And that's where I had all this filed away. I had all this filed away. I even had the newspaper that Walter Hart, the headlines and all this. The next day I had all that in his files. Yeah, it's just news that I have all these files. Only yeah. Only one was missing when you went to look for it. And that was the one pertaining to this. Yeah. Can you review that for us? Well, no. There were some of the other files were missing also, not just my own file. But my file was in the same that yeah, most of most all of my files my file was gone. But there was also some files uh, they they had really actually had destroyed most of the files that were pertaining after a certain year they just gotten rid of them. And they told uh, the manager of funeral home that's manager their name, Raymond Otero, also told me that he knew my file was there. Joe Lucas that was uh, Manager at that time knew my file for this. Okay, they then the mortuary officer. What? Okay, how would what would you do if you had to ship one out? And uh, but you couldn't do anything to it. I mean that you couldn't you know do any treatment to you. What would you do? I said the only thing you could do and that I would suggest that first thing, if you have a problem, don't want to destroy any of the tissue, any any blood cells, anything that you don't want to destroy. I would suggest that you contact the pathologist and I said I'm sure the the Army Airfield, I mean somebody's got some pathologist around. I didn't know that they had one in Roswell but I said if I were you I'd call a pathologist and take you know ask him what how he would like to have it done or whatever you're going to do or whatever it is you better do what the pathologist because he's the one that's going to do the autopsy and make the reports. But I said, the only thing I know you could do is just go to Clarity's Dairy or Sunset Creamery. We had two at the time. And buy all the dry ice you can and pack them in dry ice if that's possible. I said, I kept telling him, hey, you know, if you have a problem, if you got something out there, if you need our services, we have the contract. I would be glad to come out and help you take care of it. And he said, no, this is for future. Kept always referring this was for future use in case we did have something. But... Uh, then I, I said, well, you know, first thing you better do, you better get a hold of a pathologist. I don't know whether you have one at, at the base, I don't, but I know you probably have the top pathologist, you know, something similar to those words. And I said, that's what I do, and you better let him give you the instructions, and then you better do what he tells you to do, because he's the one that's going to do the autopsy. And you know, if, that's, if it's this sensitive, you better do what he tells you. But I said, the only other suggestion I can make that you go to Clarity's Dairy or you go to Sunset Creamery, buy all the dry ice you can and pack whatever you have, whatever the problem is, you better pack it in dry ice and then do whatever you have to do with it. Because that's the only way. They tried to put it in the morgue. Out the morgue, they had two refrigerated body compartments that we used to put them in, and then we'd go out and get the bodies from there. But... They always brought the airmen to us, but on the dependents and everything, we went out for them. But they weren't cold enough, and, the, and the, <clears throat> it became so offensive, they were afraid they were going to you know, we were going to upset everybody in the uh, hospital. So they later moved them over to a hangar. And that's the last that she knew anything about them, too. The lieutenant knew anything about them. But she didn't know how they moved it or anything about it, but they were taken to a hangar. Because the offense, the odor was so offensive, they couldn't. They like they said it was upsetting everything. 